U. U. Dear you, I tell you a story. It is about a building. No, 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 sorry, it's not. It is about stories embedded in a building. A building which, like all others, is not just concrete and cladings, but wrappers of narratives. Architecture is way beyond drawings, materials and forms. In every single detail, in every pillar or corner of the space, there is a hidden story. And we are constantly choosing which one to read, which one to live. On a chilling evening of autumn in Stockholm, when the sun was coming down, Flames illuminate the sky, merging with the colorful sunset from these moments of the year. When the colors started to fade, the sky was blurred with a solid smoke, confirming there was a fire. The graphic house, one of the listed buildings, part of the Royal Institute of Art, was completely destroyed probably caused by a combination of sunlight, window glass and inflatable paintings. By good luck, nobody got hurt. It was only a big loss of precious machines and equipment for students developing different printing techniques. What after? The school was at the beginning of the academic year and had lost 1,800 square meters in an old premise that was already overcrowded. The newly arrived student lost their studio space to work. The art institution ranked their building from Statensfatswerket, a public property manager. SFV, as it is called, evaluates seven years of reconstruction work and had also shown no interest to renovate the rent agreement with the Royal Institute of Art after the conclusion of the work. They alleged there was a high risk routine in a listed building. The Royal Institute of Art created a committee to discuss the future of the school. This was the project school premise and they hire an architecture firm to investigate two possible scenarios. The first one, how the school could look like having to squeeze in the actual premise. Or, the second, a possible move to Tonteboda. So how the school needs would fit in this new building? Tonte Boda, the Santa Claus house, what is it? Tonte is actually the first building that called my attention in Sweden. It is huge, grey, all in concrete and delicate and beautiful at the same time. I could understand the use of the building. It was too much delicate for a warehouse and too big for any other use. I entered. The building was empty, silent and full of light. There was something magic about the space, something special that you could feel that it had been full of life. The building was empty but not abandoned. It was pretty much in good condition, clean and everything was working. During the visit, my head exploded with questions. What was this building? Who built it? And for what? When? Since when was it empty? Why was it empty? I started collecting information about the building. Anywhere that had a line about on the border, I went to look up for a story. It was a ball of thread with many beginnings and endings. I started pulling it out in all directions. I was trying to understand how come such a building was empty. 
there must be a good reason or let's say just a reason. Tumte Boda was a post terminal built from 1981 to 1983. It came to being as part of a plan of modernity and efficiency for a new post service. According to the post, the previous premise was cramped and outdated. And, coach, a large centrally located post terminal was needed to handle the mail to and from Stockholm area. End quote. The new location is indeed very convenient. It's on the edge of the municipality and along the train tracks. The building is one of the largest in Sweden with a facade of 580 meters. It is basically two blocks connected by the entrance hall. One of the blocks is a normal scale office space with four floors. The other block is the biggest indoor space I have ever been. I've been into fairs and warehouse buildings, but Tonte Boda has another feeling. Fairs buildings are not in a human scale. This space is huge but humanized. The big holes, which are the core of the terminal, accommodate sorting matters machine. And even though it was a space for machines, those were by no other means operated by humans. So the architect was very attentive to the details. Also not ignoring the importance of natural light and a good circulation of air in the floor. Plus, to make the machinery work environment more soft then, and less alienating, the architect commissioned site-specific art to the operational halls. Attention here, the art piece were part of his design to the building. It was not just a framed picture hanging in the entrance hall. The hardcore operational rooms where people were jumbled with machine noise had painted murals from the most prominent artists in Sweden. Tonte Boda had been called the Sweden's most so known art gallery featuring contemporary artists from the whole country. On the top of a four operational floor, there were a space dedicated for the workers. The fifth floor had a library, a restaurant, an outdoor sculpture terrace and a sauna. Here, the workers organize all sorts of activities, such as a photo contest, a table tennis tournament with the presence of the Swedish champion Gio Waldner, and other funny family events. Apparently, Gio is a Swedish hero known as the Mozart of the table tennis. All this is reported in a Tonte Boda Post and Magazine, which is very interesting to read. I could learn more about the building than from the architecture magazines. That is why I insisted that to understand the space, we need to look more than the lines and drawings. There are so many stories that make a space. Tonte Boda Post and Magazine shows a beautiful, naive, ethical world where humans are at the center. There are machines, hours, time, money, but we are still humans operating all this and that building is translated into the architecture. On the first magazine issue, the terminal manager welcomed everyone to the building. And the first article starts with a question. What for bigger de Tonte Boda? Why build Tonte Boda? As I told you, the self-published magazine of a public institution had more interesting reflections about architecture than any other, other architectural magazines I've read. Tonte Boda was featured in different architecture editorials, especially after receiving the Tegbon Prize, the architectural prize in Sweden. In an interview, the architect of Tonte Boda, Gustav Rosenberg, explain his choice of yellow painted wood that balanced the brutal grey wish concrete in the facade. He says there is a thought behind every shape and color. Isn't it redundant to tell architects that they think about shapes and colors? 
To understand why a building come to be, who commissioned the work, for what reason, who pays, what are the interests involved, what were the social, political and cultural consequences of a specific architecture is as important as the size, material, colors and shapes of a building. Buildings are one element that creates our city. The way we create our buildings is connect the way we live in our city. Architecture can change a city, it can change the way people interact. We can't reduce architecture to shape and colors, it is much more powerful than that. In 2000, the post started a new restructuration and raised the need for a new headquarters. Curiously enough, it is just across the street from Tonteboda. Probably the 120,000 square meters of the old terminal wasn't enough for the post, especially after being less operation with the advance of electronic communication, therefore with a considerable decrease of the amount of letters. Arkane inaugurated in 2004. It is another very interesting building that features in architectural editorials with long description of the space. In all editorials there were no mention why Poston has built 60,000 square meters in front of a huge building half empty. The only explanation is again modernity and efficiency, which I don't think should be convincing anymore. A modern building in those times is already old in the inauguration day. In 2004, the post announced the construction of a new terminal in Hussersberg, another municipality. The announcement presents a very good reason to build a new terminal. Quote, it will be possible to transport volume by train instead of plane and car. Oops. But wasn't it exactly the good reason for building Tonteboda along the track lines? In Tonteboda, the train was not only beside the building, but it went inside. Hosebeck was ready in 2014, and I will not show you a picture of this terminal. Trust me, it's for your own good. Tonteboda Works moved there, and the last train left Tonteboda on April 2015. The building was left empty for irrational reasons after 32 years of its inauguration. It was just a lot of inconsistent strategy. Tonteboda was bought 8% by American company Blackstone and 20% by RM, which is the local partner of Blackstone in the Nordic region. Why an American company is interested in an old post terminal in the edge of Stockholm? For a short moment, I thought they might want to open an office in Sweden, so they would need a building, but no. Blackstone is a private investment firm founded in the US in 1985 by two Lehman Brothers former employees, Stephen Schwartzman and Peter G. Patterson. It has approximately the same age as Tonti Boda. So there too, they found a company with a strategy to invest mainly in real estate, which by that time was considered to be a risk deal in the market. Blackstone currently has $157 billion as investor capital and $324 billion in properties around the globe. To give you a general overview of the presence in the world, the Blackstone property portfolio includes hotels, office, retail, industrial and residential parties in all parts of the world. At some point, they were the owner of London Eye, Legoland and Williams Tower in Chicago. Their business operates on the concept motto, buy it, fix it and sell it. I will show you a short video, let them explain how it works. The 
strategy is very simple. We call it buy it, fix it, sell it. We try to buy income producing real estate at a discount to physical replacement costs, the cost of building that real estate. We go in and fix whatever's broken. And then once we complete whatever that mission is, we sell the asset to the right long-term owner. If you look at our track record over a long period of time, we've invested in real estate assets, office buildings, shopping centers, hotels, and yet we've generated solid returns in good and bad times. In every one of our investments, we focus on the fix-it. Without the fix-it piece, we can't have success in virtually everything we do. A good space in Blackstone terms means the one that, quote, generates profits for our investor, end quote. They are not interested in the space, the city and the people. And this is not my interpretation of their business model, but it is exactly how they explicitly present themselves. The words they use to refer to space are value, profit, investors, gain. And to generate profit, the core of their business focuses on this fixed part, which means to renovate, so to add what they call, quote, a lasting value to the property. But we know that there are different ways to generate value and also different sorts of values. And of course, Blackstone is specifically only relating to economic value for themselves. The perfect tenant is crucial in their strategy. The contact person for the lease agreements of Tonteboda described the perfect tenant as, quote, a long-term big company, for instance, a public authority, end quote. The long-term stable tenant gives the security for Blackstone to move to the next phase, sell it, and then make profit. The space, the brutalist architecture, the art pieces, the stories of the post workers, the interview with the architects, the colors and shapes, they were all reduced to money. What a brutal cutback of what a space is. Unfortunately, it's not the end of the story. This investigation is started in 2016, the year the world saw Europe perplexed with the withdrawal of Britain and also followed the ridiculous USA presidential campaign. Blackstone, CEO Stephen Schwarzman, was the first Wall Street executive to publicly comment his excitement and hope of economic growth after the US end to the polls on November 8. In 2016, he, as a traditionally Republican donor, had increased his donation 20 times compared to the previous year. In total, Stephen Schwarzman gave 5,470,000 US dollars to finance the Republican Party and support the Trump election. Not surprisingly, a few days after Donald Trump took the oath of office as the President of the United States, Stephen became the head of the advisory board of the White House. This is a panel that gives advice to the White House on economic issues. In, in their first meeting on the 3rd of February, which they have only, quote, very smart people that made money, end quote, discuss corporate tax reform and the regulation of the financial sector. Thank you everybody for being here this morning. This is a really world-class group. And I want to thank and congratulate Steve. You have done, as usual, an amazing job. Steve called me up. Uh, the day after the election, it might have even been the same night, Jamie, to be honest with you. You know, Steve, probably not. In fact, never, hit maybe one minute. And he said, I'd like to put together a group of world-class leaders, and that's what he's done. So good job, Steve. Give me a hand. Right, so. 
Uh, but I see we have Larry here. Where is Larry? I think Larry did a great job for me. He managed a lot of my money, and I have to tell you, he got me great returns, Larry. <laughs> And then they go crazy when we use very smart people that made money. Why don't you get other people to run the economy? I said, no, we have to get the right people. And the people that voted for me understand that, and that's what they want. So uh, when I campaigned for office, I promised the American people that I'd ask for our country's best and brightest, and we have that. Blackstone is part of Tom Teboda. Stephen Schwarzman is part of Tonteboda. Donald Trump is part of Tonteboda. It all depends how far you want to pull the thread, how far you want to know and take responsibility for it. Mapping all stories in place in the same page made possible to move the connections that were hidden. It put the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm in close connection to the White House in the USA. It made clear that if the Royal Institute of Art, which is a public education institution supported by Swedish tax money, moved to Tonteboda, the university would be paying rent, so giving public money to a private company that directly financed Trump campaign. This isn't illegal and we are not talking about a case of corruption. It's a question of morality and responsibility. How could an art institution be cynical about that connection? And how that would not compromise their independence and free critical thinking? Why the Tonteboda Post and Magazine showed the naive ethical world with humans at the center the financial and editorial showed a different world where money are at the center. And this is all part of the same story, the story of Tonteboda till today. But we need to remember that we can choose which story do we want to continue. The architecture firm continued with the feasibility study fitting the university programs in the new possible space. It was presented with plans and a visual renderings. What the architecture feasibility study missed was a critical holistic thought of the suitability of that space. I made a drawing mapping the stories of Tonteboda. In one image, there was all the information that I had just narrated you. you. For me, this is an architectural drawing. It's not like the ones that we normally see in architectural magazines, but it contains information of the space as relevant as a floor plan, or even more relevant. I didn't know that Donald Trump's face would appear between the pillars of Tonteboda. From the beginning, my investigation didn't intend to find mistakes or corruption schemes or anything I like. I was just trying to understand the space. I invite architects to design or visit space with questions. I invite architects to not limit their questions to the materials and forms. I invite architects to take responsibility while designing and to have in mind that every decision can change the story, can change our society. Olha, eu tenho que dizer uma coisa lá do fundo do meu coração para vocês. Sempre nesse me liga, liga, me me três, 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 me